and welcome back to the channel. Amber here. I don't do a lot of off the cuff reviews on things, but it's Sunday. I'm feeling good. I finished this about a week ago and I really wanted to talk about Mercy of the Gods with spoilers. I did a no spoiler episode last week, but this one is going to be spoiler filled. If you enjoy these types of things, please like and subscribe to the channel. I'm almost at 5k, which is really exciting for me. But Mercy of the Gods, we've got a lot of different characters and they're not as tight knit as you would see in The Expanse. They're, there's a little bit of that found family aspect, but it's still much too early. This is a much slower building book leading up to something like that found family that you're going to notice and that a lot of people really loved from the expanse. In one of the big mysteries starting out with this book, we have a group of humans on a planet called Anjin. They know that they've been there about 3,000 years, something like that, but it's lost to time. They don't really know how they got there. They don't know where they came from. It's just kind of vague in that aspect. And this kind of reminded me of parts of the expanse Specifically like the team on Illus, when we get that in book four, after the ring gate opens up, people going out everywhere throughout the universe. And in The Mercy of Gods, it's almost as if the humans showed up on a planet and were kind of stuck there. They don't know where they came from. They don't know how they really got there. Their origin story is kind of mysterious. As the book goes further, we meet this entity called the Swarm. And I really liked The Swarm despite it being a bit confusing because The Swarm is kind of like, if you've ever watched The Thing, it's kind of like The Thing. It's almost like a consciousness that can jump into one human to the next. And it's never really v revealed if they can hop within other species yet. So far, we only see them move from one host to the other and those are all humans. One of the fun theories that kind of like links these two segments together is since we don't know where the humans on Anjin came from, you can assume that there are humans out there somewhere else in space. And I think it might be possible that the swarm is some type of human creation or consciousness. I don't know if it's tech. I don't know if it's biological. One of the one things that would be really interesting is if it was like a hybrid, like a blend between technology and something biological that humans on their home world, like the original humans had made and created as a way to step in and save these other humans, this other branch of humanity that's out there. It goes hand in hand with what the research team on Anjin with our main characters are interested in anyways. So we have David and Tanner Fries and their group, and they seem more or less structured around this research project where it's trying to combine the biomes between hum humans and the biomes that were already originating on Anjin. And like I said, if you've read The Expanse, it's very similar to this speech that else is it? It's ok Okoye, I think was her name in The Expanse. But she's talking about how once they arrived on Illus, the world had one biome and then humans show up and then the biomes get changed and intermixed and intermingled. And that's what this research team on Anjan is exploring and studying and how these two biomes can be connected. When all hell breaks loose and the Karax show up and take humans, there's this really big culling of the humans that are on Anjan. I think it's one eighth of everyone is killed and they only take like Earth's best and brightest. You eventually learn that it's like researchers and people in the arts, people who are like at the top of the top in terms of what their field is. And so we've got that going on. They're tasked with solving this problem, this like biological problem where they are to 
somehow figure out how to feed one species with another material produced by another species. They don't know the origins of either of these creatures or forms of life, but that's what they're tasked to do. And I think one of the really fun things about this book is watching this whole team go into like full gear about how they are going to get this work done and prove their usefulness to the car acts. Because if they're not useful, the car acts very ambivalent about morality. They don't care. You have to be useful. You have to be able to produce and pull your own weight. And we see that later on when David's group is able to solve this problem, this experiment, while the other group, and this is another species that they're in competition with, called the Night Drinkers. I always, I have to laugh at that because throughout this entire book, the names are just, there's, there are a lot, okay? Like Tonner Fries, Carax, there's a bunch of kind of strangely named creatures and locations. And then when we finally get the name for the, I guess it's the translation of what this species is called. It's called the Night Drinkers. And I really enjoyed all of these interactions between David's research group and the Night Drinkers once they arrive on Carax. I think these were probably the most action-packed sequences, especially when we have the two coming into like multiple skirmishes and I think this is a good time to move to my favorite characters because Jessen I think out of all of the characters has the most character building and she's probably the most interesting I think just because we spend a lot of time with her and we understand her motivations I think a bit more than some of the others and she's pretty sympathetic but also really easy to root for. And she has, it's an, un, it's an unspoken medical problem dealing with her mental health. She never outright says what it is, but we know she takes medication for it. And as they're put in this Hunger Games type situation, Justin realizes that if they're able to create a substance to feed this other species which was a part of the test then she can also possibly find a way to create her medication that's going to keep her balanced as all of this is going on this competition with the night drinkers is getting pretty heated and you see a flip in her character where she's at one point you know like despair, despondent, just struggling to go about day to day without harming herself. And when this first interaction with the night drinkers happens, they storm their research space and they end up killing one of her research partners. She feels this immense guilt over it. And on one hand, you really feel for Jessen and what she's going through and all of her struggles. But then like you see the switch in her where she just becomes absolutely fierce and really hellbent on not so much justice, but vengeance. She becomes a killer. She's actively searching out these creatures, the night drinkers, to kill almost in a therapeutic way because it's creating a way for her to disassociate from the other problems that are going on with her health. On one hand, it's kind of scary how she comes to terms with finding this out for herself. But on the other hand, all of this suffering that's happening, you're, you're sitting with these humans and you're really hoping for a win. And so when she goes hellbent on vengeance and killing, it's really hard not to root for this character because of everything that we've seen them go through. You could see her going kind of rogue. I don't know what will happen to this character in the future, but I think it's possible you could see her becoming like an Amos Burton type character, just very detached when it comes to as what they refer to it in the expanse of the churn. So having no problem dealing out violence 
if it's a way to survive. On the other hand, I could see this almost becoming something that could make her somewhat antagonistic or almost someone who is like a villain. But knowing how James S. E. Corey has structured their previous book series, I'm kind of leaning towards this becoming her, one of her character traits, if you will, and it becoming something useful for her and maybe useful for, ho hopefully not useful for the car acts, but <laughs> we shall see, we shall see. The other character that I really enjoyed was David, who's pretty much like our protagonist. We spend the, the first pages from his point of view. And I really liked David. I've seen some other people online being like, nah, not a fan. But what I do appreciate about this character is he's an overthinker. And a lot of the times he's stuck in his own thoughts and he's silently and quietly sitting off to the side and observing. He is very calculated and he is very intuitive. And what I love about that is a lot of the times in fantasy and in science fiction, your protagonist is a doer. They might be a bit more of an extrovert. They might fit into that more like stereotypical like action hero type role or archetype. And David's not that. He's more of a thinker. And as a researcher, you can tell that he's not so much gifted in terms when it comes to like his research grew, but where his giftedness comes through is almost like his study of humanity and cause and effect and getting to understand what really drives the Karaks, what are their weaknesses, what makes them tick. For that aspect, I think he's a really interesting character and I've enjoyed watching him sit back and plot. He's very, he's very kind of soft spoken and He's off to the side until you get to this point in the books where he oversteps Tanner Fries as the acting leader of the group. And I really enjoyed that part of the story. One, because we don't know, we know David is supposed to be a betrayer of some sort. Now in this first book, I'm not quite sure that a big betrayal really happened yet. So maybe that's coming later. But him taking over leadership of the group was therapeutic for me because Tanner Fries is just, he feels like someone who's not a people person, someone who's just very intelligent, but just very bad at dealing with humans. <laughs> like Tanner Fries, not great with human interactions at all all and he's not a lovable character but on one aspect it's all it's almost coming off as humorous because the guy is he's constantly saying things that are just inappropriate i guess like when he's trying to when he's coming to terms with what other characters have said or done he acts very childish and immature so you get the feeling that he's got like a very low emotional iq but a very high regular iq <laughs> and for that matter like some of his moments can come off a little bit humorous but He's not traditionally likable in the sense of like, oh, he's a fun guy. And for the most part, these three characters felt to me the more fleshed out. But then on the side, we have other characters like Elsa and Jellet. I had to think about it for a second because I was like, am I going to say that name right? Yes, it's Jellet. So Elsa she's the love interest of David but it turns out like as this book goes along we find out that Elsa is actually inhabited by the swarm so at some point she becomes a host for the swarm and as she is I don't want to quite call it a parasite because I can't be certain that it's parasitic. I don't know if they're actually inhabiting her body or if they're inhabiting her consciousness. So I have to put a pin in that. But as the swarm is inside of her, they are also becoming changed by her thoughts and feelings towards others. And as much as the swarm is changing her, she's changing the swarm which i we don't really know too much about 
what the swarm is, how they came to be, how it works, like the actual like mechanics of how it works. But I did find the swarm interesting. I'm I don't I wish that it would have gone a little bit further. Like I wish the book wouldn't have ended where it did so we would get maybe some more answers and I think that's one of the aspects that made this book the pacing feel a little bit slower, a little bit more what you would expect with hard sci-fi. And I'm not saying that this book is fully hard sci-fi, but I feel like it's leaning a little bit more in that direction than The Expanse because it is so scientific base. Science makes up, I would say, the majority of the plot on this one. So yeah, there's that. So anyways, we've got Elsa. We've also got Jellet, who is the sister of Jessen, and he is host number, I think, three for the swarm. We see them jump into multiple people. And I did find myself wondering what the point of his character will be in the future because now we have a brother and sister group of survivors in this story but one is currently not fully human she doesn't know that so i don't know how that's going to come into play but i feel like if this is discovered or if this is if this becomes something that Jessen uncovers, we might see her really flip into high-strung emotional killer or someone who's just kind of devoid from emotion and starts to break off from the group to do her own thing. I'm not quite sure yet, but I did appreciate the inclusion of Jellet for that reason because I think that's going to give Jessen something really rough to deal with in the future if it becomes knowledge that Jellet is a part of the swarm. And I guess the other aspect of this book that I really liked was all of the different species. I think I'm a fan of Three Body Problem, The Remembrance of Earth's Past Trilogy, and one of the major complaints of people that have I have recommended this book series to is people thinking, oh, okay, like it's an invasion story, and then they read the book and they're like, but where are the aliens? And I'm like, oh, yeah, like it's it's not the typical invasion story where you get to see the aliens. There's no signs like moment where the alien crosses the camera and everybody's like, ah. That's not that story. So if you're looking for something like that, I think that's where the mercy of gods can really shine because it is just, it's teeming with different species out the wazoo. And I really loved this little interlude chapter where David and Elsa have won, I guess. They won the translation box. So all of these different species on Carax obviously cannot communicate with one another without this translator and once it's acquired we have this whole segment where David and Elsa are going from species to get their story and to understand how they got there and what they're like and this small chapter alone felt like a really nice master class in world building and whether or not you find it super interesting like, you can't deny the fact that it is really just, you can't deny the fact that it's just really imaginative. And that was one of the aspects that I really enjoyed, especially in this book where some moments felt a little bit slower. You can still appreciate that type of thing when it's in there. So moving on from characters and stuff like that is a bit slow in terms of the plot where the humans are scooped up and they're on the transport to the Karax world. That part went a little bit slow for me and I think it's because I understood immediately just how awful it was and you get the fear it really drives home the fact that the Carax are emotionless. Emotions don't serve them. They don't need them. 
they see as all other species as a tool. And I felt, yeah, I get it. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so I think for me, things really start to heat up once we have that first skirmish between the night drinkers and Jessen and Irina. That part felt like when things really kicked off. The other aspect to this is the Carax themselves. And I think what makes them interesting is that they don't feel too otherworldly. There's enough there that you understand what their motives are, and they're not too bizarre to the point where they don't feel interesting. And I don't know if you've ever watched anything about mantis shrimp, but they have these like claws that, <laughs> that can, they move so fast, it almost creates like a gunshot underwater and they can really stun their prey and they can just like bash like clams open for like pound for their size they're like extremely deadly okay and that's what the Karaks are mimicking i know that there's one part of the books where they've landed on anjan and david witnesses they they end up clapping a body into just like a vapor <laughs> that's all that's left just like blood guts and david's whoa that's that's frightening they're a wacky but brutal and scary alien, and I appreciate that. I think the series is really fun, though. I would have liked the book to be a little bit bigger, even, and maybe some of it feels a little bit too slow if you are if you're looking for an expanse part two. I think the highlight for me is that this book in general feels like where it ends this world is going to open up and it has the potential to be this really epic space opera and probably something more like I was expecting from the get-go. Book one feels a bit like a very large prologue. That's okay. I don't mind the slower pace but I think as the series goes on it's going to get bigger and more expansive, probably weirder too. <laughs> but on top of that, they have a novella coming out in October that goes along with the book series, like the main book series, similar to how they did it with The Expanse. I'm really looking forward to that. You will want to read The Mercy of Gods first and then get into the novella. But I'm really excited. I'm really happy for James S.A. Corey to come out with their sophomore series. I would understand if you're a big Expanse fan and this isn't really your cup of tea, but I feel like this is maybe weirder and more cerebral and a little bit more thoughtful. So I think a lot of people are going to be happy in general, just if you are a sci-fi fan and you enjoy a lot of like scientific themes and aliens and stuff like that. It's really fun, I think, if you are into sci-fi. I do think it just depends whether or not you fall into the category of someone who likes more action, adventure, sci-fi. I Personally, I think The Mercy of Gods is more in line with Children of Time or Remembrance of Earth's Past Trilogy versus something like Red Rising. But that's... I've only read the first book, so I can't quite say, but I'm really excited to see where things go. So thanks for hanging out with me. I am very close to hitting 5,000 subscribers. And if you would like to like this video, if you would like to subscribe to the channel, that would be awesome. If you would like to share this, that would be awesome as well. And yeah, if you've read this book, please let me know what you thought. Drop in your theories and ideas into the comments section. I'm really excited to talk about this. I don't do a ton of book reviews on the channel, but I would like to change that. So yeah, that wraps things up and I will see you next time.